Good evening, everyone, and welcome to E-Bible Fellowship's Bible Study in the Book of First Samuel. Tonight is study number 77, and we're continuing looking at our verse in First Samuel 4, verse 11, which says, And the ark of God was taken. And in our last study, we're looking at several verses that just highlight the tremendous importance that the people of Israel would have placed upon the ark of God as it signified the very presence of God with his people Israel. And then uh, towards the end of our study, we turn to Jeremiah chapter 26. And I want to turn there again and read these verses once again, because it brings up an interesting point in Jeremiah 26, beginning in verse 4, it says, And thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith Jehovah, If ye will not hearken to me to walk in my law, which I have set before you, to hearken to the words of my servants the prophets, whom I sent unto you, both rising up early and sending them, but ye have not hearkened, then will I make this house like Shiloh, will make this city a curse to all the nations of the earth. So the priests and the prophets and all the people heard Jeremiah speaking these words in the house of Jehovah. Now it came to pass when Jeremiah had made an end of speaking all that Jehovah had commanded him to speak unto all the people, that the priests and the prophets and all the people took him, saying, Thou shalt surely die. Why hast thou prophesied in the name of Jehovah? saying, This house shall be like Shiloh, and this city shall be desolate without an inhabitant. And all the people were gathered against Jeremiah in the house of Jehovah. So God sent Jeremiah to warn Judah that they had better watch out. They were not hearkening, and we could go to many places in the Bible where God warns if you do not hearken. And the word hearkens a, a very significant word. It's not just listening as hearing words. Yes, Israel heard the words of the prophets. They heard Jeremiah speaking, and they maybe even nodded their head when Jeremiah would declare the word of God. That's not hearkening. That's just hearing with your physical ears. To hearken means you hear and obey. You respond with acts of obedience to what you're hearing. Or, at the very least, you cry out to God, Oh, God, have mercy, because I, I do hear what you're saying, and I see that we're not listening we're not obeying you have mercy upon us we we need your help to obey and israel did or judah did none of that they did not hearken and so god warned them i will make this house like shiloh and the people of israel recognized what was being said to them what do you mean saying this house will be like Shiloh. And notice what that meant to them. They go on to say, and this city shall be desolate without inhabitant. That's what they were saying, that Jeremiah was telling them that the city Jerusalem, the cities of Judah, would be desolate without an inhabitant, just like Shiloh. But we don't find in the Bible that the citizens of Shiloh were removed. We don't find that they were taken captive as the Jews of Judah were taken captive and sent into captivity. All we find when we read about Shiloh is that the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of God was taken and the Ark was removed. But the people themselves, they weren't taken captive by the Philistines. So this is a very significant statement that helps us to understand what it means to be desolate. 
that's a fairly common word that God uses to speak of his judgment upon his people. And it's a word that's even in the New Testament. And so let's take a look at some of these verses. For instance, in Jeremiah chapter 9, in verse 11, it says, And I will make Jerusalem heaps and a den of dragons, and I will make the cities of Judah desolate without an inhabitant. And, and that statement again, to be made desolate without an inhabitant, just like we read in Jeremiah 26. And it's also in Jeremiah 51. In verse 29, it says, And the land shall tremble and sorrow, for every purpose of Jehovah shall be performed against Babylon, to make the land of Babylon a desolation without an inhabitant. It's an identical statement, or actually the more identical statement is found in verse 37 of Jeremiah 51. And Babylon shall become heaps, a dwelling place for dragons, an astonishment, and a hissing without an inhabitant. That's very similar to what we read in Jeremiah 9-11. And, and so Jerusalem will be desolate without an inhabitant. Babylon will be desolate and without an inhabitant. Just like Shiloh, as we read in Jeremiah 26. Well, can we know exactly what this means? Can we know without any question what God is saying when he makes this statement that Judah and Jerusalem will be desolate without an inhabitant, or Babylon will be desolate without an inhabitant? And the answer is yes, we can, because the Lord has given us another verse, and this one very helpful, that will define these statements. And, and this is how God wrote the Bible. There's normally a verse somewhere as we're trying to find an answer to questions that arise from passages in the Bible, and we search out words, and normally there's going to be a word that's used in a verse somewhere else that is going to be very helpful in defining the word in the verse we're interested in. And that's how God wrote the Bible. That's how the Bible is its own dictionary, how the Bible defines itself, how comparing Scripture with Scripture is the way to come to truth. We don't go outside of the Bible. We look elsewhere, and and as we do, it enlightens us. It it gives us additional information. And here in Jeremiah 6, in uh, this passage, verses 6 through 8, God will define what he means by being desolate and without an inhabitant. It says, For thus hath Jehovah of hosts said, Hew you down trees, and cast them out against Jerusalem. This is the city to be visited. She is holy oppression in the midst of her. As a fountain casteth out her waters, so she casteth out her wickedness. Violence and spoil is heard in her. Before me continually is grief and wounds. Be thou instructed, O Jerusalem, lest my soul depart from thee, lest I make thee desolate, a land not inhabited. There is the verse, verse 8, that is very helpful that shines the light on that statement of what God has in view by this language of being made desolate and without an inhabitant. Let's read it again. Be thou instructed, O Jerusalem, lest my soul depart from thee. And what would another way of saying that be if we used another word in place of soul? Lest my spirit depart from thee and that would be the holy spirit the spirit of god the spirit that is absolutely necessary for the health and spiritual well-being of entities like old testament israel and the new testament churches and congregations without the spirit of god what are they or what were they nothing 
with the Spirit of God, well, then they have blessing. They have vitality. They have spiritual life. But without the Spirit of God, there is no life. There is no blessing. There is no salvation. And here God is warning Jerusalem. Be instructed, that is, take knowledge of this. I want you to learn this. Lest my soul, my spirit, depart from thee. And now, in the second part of the verse, God is going to restate what he said in the first part. And this is a common occurrence in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament. And theologians have a term for it. They call it Hebrew parallelism. That is, God will say something in the first part of the verse, and then restate it in different terms or using different words in the second part of the verse, but it's saying the very same thing. They're synonymous. Lest my soul depart from thee, lest I make thee desolate, a land not inhabited. In other words, when God makes this statement, when we find this statement in the Bible, that Shiloh was made desolate, without an inhabitant, or that it's a warning to Judah that the same thing will happen to you. It is a statement that means that God's Spirit will depart from you. And if God's Spirit departs from you, you will be left desolate. You will be left without an inhabitant. It's not referring to people. You can still have people who inhabit or dwell in a land as um, after the veil of the temple was rent in twain in 33 AD. There were still Jews living in Israel, but God departed from them. They would no longer be his people. After God ended the church age in 1988, you still had all kinds of people in congregations around the world, but of course... The one significant, very significant absence was the Spirit of God. And once God left, he left the land desolate. Isn't that what we read in Matthew 24? In the chapter where Christ is answering the disciples' question, what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And he goes into detail about um, the apostasy that will come upon the churches. And he also says in verse 15 of Matthew 24, when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. So here Jesus makes mention of an abomination of desolation. And uh, he refers us back to Daniel. And so let's go back to Daniel. And it's found in a couple places, but we'll turn to Daniel 12 and verse 11, where it says, and from the time that the daily, it, it sacrifices in italics, but Daily is a is a better understanding of that. And the daily really encompasses all that is associated with the truth of God, the light of the gospel, God himself. And let me begin again. And from the time that the daily shall be taken away and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. So here... The daily is removed, and then the abomination of desolation set up. It's a transaction, and it's a transaction that took place at the end of the church age because the Spirit of Christ was in the midst of the congregations. That's just a figure of speech indicating that God's Spirit was dwelling in the churches, advancing the cause of the gospel through the churches, Individuals could have been saved all throughout the church age in congregations that were bringing the truth of the gospel 
according to the degree that God had opened it up. Individuals could have been saved. The church was the place to be. It's where God wanted his people to be found, in the churches, in the congregations. But then, after that period of time of the church age ended, after 1955 years, the spiritual transaction took place, where the Spirit of God left, and the spirit of Satan entered in. He, he is the abomination of desolation, and he took his seat as the man of sin. Remember what it says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, in verse 7, and in the following verse, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let. And the letteth and let are old English and it's better understood that he who now restrains will restrain. And the he, the personal pronoun he, is referring to the Holy Spirit. He is restraining sin. He who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Just as the daily is taken away. Just as the Ark of the Covenant was taken by the Philistines, the ark that represented the very presence of God with his people. And that is teaching us of God's plan for the churches, for the congregations. At the appropriate time in God's timetable, which took place in May of 1988, it was God's plan to take him out of the way, to take the Holy Spirit out of the way. And then it says in verse 8, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. And the wicked is Satan. He, he is revealed during the Great Tribulation as the man of sin, the abomination of desolation. We know who he is from the Bible alone the bible is that which sheds light on the spiritual condition of the churches and congregations we realize this is why as god provides the answer for the incredible the the outlandish apostasy that has come on the church world now some people in the churches they're they're taken aback. They're appalled at the hearing of the idea that the church age is over. And you just have to wonder, well, why are they appalled? Why do they think it's such an incredible thing? Do they not have eyes? Do they not have ears? Can't they look around and see what has happened to the church world? Look back in history. Where in the history of the New Testament church has it ever been found that there have been so many women that have entered into the pulpit and have become elders and deacons and pastors and bishops and so on? And God very clearly says he suffers not a woman to teach. Where is that found? You might find it's true. You might find a Jezebel reference or two. You might find an instance in a, in a church gone astray here or there, but not to this degree. This is everywhere in Reformed churches, in Charismatic churches, in all churches. Women are taking a role that God forbids. Or just look at homosexuality and, and the way that's now being accepted by congregations. Where do you find that in the church history in all the many centuries since the first century A.D.? We're in the 21st now, but in all the many centuries up until the 20th, where would you find homosexual bishops or the practice of homosexuality being talked about as acceptable, as something that, sure, you could still be a believer and participate in? No, there is nothing like that. It's not found. 
You won't find speaking in tongues, falling over backwards, holy laughter. You're not going to find the total just ruination of the gospel that we have today in the churches and congregations of the world. And it's nowhere to be found. Something drastic, something unbeknown that has never occurred in the history of the church age has taken place just recently. And why is that? And why does it agree so well with the biblical timelines calendar of history that has pinpointed the end of the church age back in 1988? Why are the actions and the rebelliousness of the churches matching up so perfectly with that information? The reason is that God has opened the scriptures and he has revealed the man of sin. He's letting us know. We we don't have to look for another time. This is the time that the Bible has spoken of. There is no question. You know, there are some individuals, and they're questioning everything. Oh, May 21 didn't happen. Oh, so we're wrong about this, and we're wrong about that. And they don't realize that God brought about a spiritual judgment. And one main reason that he did this is to provide a perfect test for those professed Christians, for those very people who are saying nothing happened and who are so confused. It is a test to see if they will trust the word of God or what were they trusting? What did they think? When they heard about the end of the church age, when they read these things, did they study it at all? Did they check it out for themselves at all? Or were they just going by what they heard? The true believer doesn't just accept things that that people say. We listen, and then we go to the Bible like a Berean, and we check to see if it's so. And the true child of God has done that. And that's why if we were tested in the manner that we're being tested today, well, not everything Um, falls apart because we've thoroughly checked out these other things. We realize that it was biblical truth. It was the word of God. And, And so we're not shaken in many different ways, as some are. And now they want to go back to the churches. Well, what are you going back to? You're going back to a place that is in bondage, just like the Israelites in the wilderness. When they were tested, And they had some difficult times. Oh, they started finally remembering the cucumber and the leeks and all the good things of the land of Egypt. What perverse thinking that is. They were slaves in bitter bondage. Pharaoh ruled them with cruelty. Their taskmasters whipped them. And they forgot all about that for a few cucumbers and leeks because the sun was hot in the wilderness and their way was long and they despised the manna that God provided for them. And, well, we had better not forget. We had better not begin with any kind of uh, mirage, thinking that the church is the place to return to. The churches are desolate. The churches are without an inhabitant. The Spirit of God is nowhere to be found in the Catholic, in the Presbyterian, in the Lutheran, in the Episcopalian, in the Independent, in the House Church. They're nowhere to be found in America, in China, or India, or any nation. You cannot find the Spirit of God in any congregation in the world because God has departed the glory of has departed from the churches. That's not the place to look. And anyone who has it in their mind is playing around with that. Well, you're playing with fire, as the old saying goes, and you'll certainly be burnt because that is the last place on earth anyone should want to be. It is the most spiritually dangerous place there is. Well, we'll uh, continue taking a look at this phrase, without an inhabitant, in our next study 
and then we'll pick up once again with the study of 1 Samuel.